right, everybody, welcome back. If you're watching on Twitch, I've got uh, Canvas chat up, so if you have any questions as we go along, feel free to throw questions over there. Um, our plan for today is finish up uh, working with anonymous functions, so we're going to spend a little bit of time with functions of one variable, just to look at a little quirk of anonymous functions. Um, and then we'll look at how to use anonymous functions of two variables to help us when we're trying to solve systems of two equations. So there's some things we can do with plotting. Uh, there's a different kind of uh, an anonymous function called a wrapper function, which is still just an anonymous function. It's just a what we call it when we do something with them. Um, none of this, as a reminder, is necessary for the homework that's due on Monday. Homework five uses local functions for solving stuff over there. Homework six that'll be posted on Monday will use um, anonymous functions. So don't rely on any of this for the, the homework that's due. Um, although I suppose if you would like to use it, you can, but those are mostly requesting uh, local functions specifically. And then the goal for next week, so we're into week 10 next week, um, Monday and Wednesday, we'll introduce the syntax for solving differential equations and systems of differential equations. But just remember that's not gonna show up on the homework, it's not gonna show up on the final or anything like that. I just want you to know about it because it comes up in a lot of other classes. Um, and so I want you to have seen it and practiced it a little bit, um, at least here in class. Uh, and then Friday, the last day of class, I don't really have any solid plans for what we're gonna do Friday yet. Um, it's kind of dumb to introduce brand new material on the last Friday of class. Um, so it, we may cancel it. I may just turn it into like an office hours. It, it depends on how we do with um, ODEs, um, but we'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm not sure what's gonna happen with that. Um, okay, we're gonna make two sets of notes over in MATLAB, so let's switch over there really quick. Okay, um, our first set of notes is gonna be about uh, anonymous functions. Specifically, what happens when they are defined. Um, so the idea that you should walk away with here is that uh, whenever you define an anonymous function, it stays that way uh, forever. Well, Let's put forever in quotes, like until you clear it or delete it or close MATLAB or something like that. Um, it's not like it writes it permanently to your memory or something like that. So for example, let's take that uh, common equation that we've had before, which was um, f of x is equal to x minus um, cosine of x. But instead of just plain old x, let's make it x plus c uh, inside of the um, cosine. And we're gonna pretend that we want to um, plot this with a, an anonymous function. So something that we might do is define c as equal to one, and then our f would be at x. Remember, that's how we start our anonymous function definition. Uh, that tells it the variable of interest here is x. And then we write x as minus, uh, sorry, x minus cosine of x plus c. When we do that, c will be set equal to one inside of that anonymous function. It will know that it doesn't need to go look for a value of x, but it should go look for a value of c somewhere in the workspace. And by the time it gets to line two, c will have been defined as one, um, and so it'll effectively insert a one right there. And then to plot it, we can just say f plot f. Um, let's use black, uh, we haven't used triangles before. Let's use triangles. If you put the caret in there, you'll get a triangle. little triangle markers on your plot. So we'll give that a second. Uh, I should probably save this too. Oops, not B2. B. So there's our plot. Um, perfect, I, that's supposedly what we would want. Now let's say we wanted to plot on that same figure another curve for F but with a different value of C. What you would usually be uh, tempted to do, at least initially, um, is to say something like, all right, let's set c is equal to two, and then say f plot f, and we'll use, I don't know, red circles this time. And we should call our hold on as well. It's 
put that up here um, just so that it doesn't forget. And then we'll throw a hold on afterwards, or sorry, hold off afterwards. And if we do that, we see that the red line and the red circles appear to be exactly where they were before. Um, and in fact, regardless of what we set C, even if we set C to be five and then plot it again, and let's do blue, let's say X's for the blue line, you can throw yet another one on there um, and it continues to just replot right on top of itself over and over and over and over again. The reason for this is because of this feature up here, which is when you define the anonymous function, it stays that way forever. So when it was first defined up here with that value of C, it took C is equal to one. We never redefined the anonymous function. So even down here, it continued to think that at least inside of the anonymous function, C was still one because it was, it's permanent. Once you define the function, it keeps all of those parameters and doesn't update them. So if you want to change it, you have to redefine the function. Um, to update coefficients requires you uh, to redefine the local function, or sorry, the anonymous function. Like this. So everywhere we've got the C, um, we need to copy that and essentially paste it underneath there and update the anonymous function every single time uh, that we want to change one of those um, parameters. And if you do that and then replot this, now you'll see that we're getting different responses, right? It, it's not behaving the same way anymore. Uh, and that's because every time we change C, we also redefine the anonymous function, and so therefore it will plot the updated anonymous function instead of the old one. Which is kind of uh, I mean, it's kind of annoying. At the same time, we don't often have a problem like this where an anonymous function has a parameter that has to get changed um, a lot. There is another option, which is that your anonymous function can have more than one input. Um, so you can also define the anonymous function to have that parameter C as an extra input. So I'm gonna change the name so that it doesn't think it's the same one. Um, we can also define it as G is equal to a function now of X and C. Uh, and now we can write cosine of X plus C. And now every time we call that function, it will update the C because it thinks it's another input. The problem with that is it now becomes slightly more annoying to plot it. To plot this kind of function uh, with F plot, requires what's called a wrapper function. So for example, let's start a new figure. And let's say I wanted to say f plot g. And I don't know, we'll just leave it as g. Right? We'll add some line specs later. If you try to just do something like that, MATLAB won't know how to handle it. It'll say, OK, f plot is expecting a function of one variable and yet you've given me a function handle, or an anonymous function in this case, to something that requires two inputs, and it doesn't know how to handle that. It, it says right there in the error, it's gotta be a function or functions of single variables, not um, multiple variables. So the wrapper function, it's, it's not really a function in the sense that like MATLAB doesn't know wrapper as any different from anything else. All it means is we need to wrap the G function inside of another function that handles the C appropriately. So for example, right inside of fplot, we can define another anonymous function that says take G at X, but now evaluate uh, C at like 3.4. So here the wrapper is that at X, G of X, 3.4. Right? It, it takes the G function and sort of wraps it inside of another function where the C has now been defined. And if you run something like that, MATLAB will be okay with it. It'll know what you're talking about. Um, and now you can change that 3.4 to be whatever else it is you want it to be, so maybe two or something like that. Um, and this works just fine. So there are equivalent ways of um, achieving the same thing. It, it's, or I shouldn't say they're equivalent ways. They are different ways of achieving the same thing. You can also define that wrapper function 
explicitly. So you could say something like at x, g of x comma, I don't know, 2.5, something like that, and then just plot the wrapper directly. You don't have to call it wrapper either. It can be called anything that you want, um, but that they will both work. It just sort of depends on what your use case is as to which one of those seems easier for you. Um, neither one of them is computationally more efficient than the other one. And MATLAB will handle them both just fine. It, it's not like you're causing infinite loops or something like that. It's just defining another function, and, and MATLAB's OK with that. It, it's not going to cost you anything um, in order to do something like that. But that's a, a key idea to keep in mind with um, anonymous functions, and you're going to have a homework problem like that on homework uh, six, where you'll have to generate those heat capacity curves that we did uh, on a previous homework, which have a bunch of constants in them, and those constants have to be changed before the definition of the anonymous function is made. Um, otherwise, it won't know what the appropriate set of uh, coefficients are. So I'll just hang out here. We're going to start another set of notes on um, F-solve here in a moment. So I'll just give us a second to catch up with anything that we've got. Any other typing to do? All right, let's start another set of notes. Uh, and this set of notes will be um, using fsurf to help with fsolve. Uh, the last time that I had introduced um, anonymous functions, I said they were, there were a couple of pairs that went together really well. There was fplot goes with f0, because those are both designed for working with functions of one variable, um, and fsolve and fsurf tend to go together as well. They're designed to work with more than one variable, but this is usually limited um, to two variables. fsolve can do more. We've, we've seen a couple of examples of that, um, but fsurf cannot. fsurf is pretty much restricted to, to two variables. So we've had two functions before. We're just going to redefine them really quick um, as g1 and g2. I think last time we called them functions of x1 and x2, and here I'm just going to call them x and y. So one of them was 3x cubed plus 4y squared minus 145. And I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see that. And the other one, g2, was also a function of x and y. It just looked a little bit different. It was 4x squared uh, minus y cubed plus 28. We can use um, f surf uh, to visualize both of these. The surf part of f surf means a surface function or a surface plot, uh, so it will draw them as kind of a sheet, and that's going to help us visualize stuff eventually. So we define these um, as anonymous functions the same way we normally would. So just like we can do x and c, we can do x and y too. It, it doesn't care how many variables there are. Uh, plus four times y squared minus 145. And g2 is the same kind of definition, but of course the equation is a little bit different. Minus y cubed plus 28. And if you want to plot one thing as um, a surface, the minimum that you have to call is not unlike what we did with uh, f0, or sorry, um, f plot. Oops. 
or I've messed up my dot right there. Dot should be over there. So if you say f surf of a single function, it will plot that function as a surface, which is kind of what we're interested in. Um, if you hover your mouse over here, depending on how fast your computer is, mine's kind of slow, um, eventually it will switch to a little cursor that will allow you to rotate around. It's very easy to quickly get lost. Um, so for example, right now, I don't know which of those two axes on the bottom left and bottom right correspond to X and Y. Z is usually an easy one, but I, I don't know because it keeps moving them around. So in this one, more than anything else, um, it's very important uh, to always label your axes. And you can label the Z axis with Z label instead of X and Y uh, label. So that'll be G1. If you want to add another plot um, onto the same one, just do a hold on like you have before. So F surf G2. And it'll overlay another plot right on top of it. We can update our um, Z label. So this is either G1 or G2. Um, and we'll label our, put a title on there just so we don't forget exactly what is showing up in this plot. It's G1 and G2. If you want to change the range over which it plots, there's a couple of different ways that you can do it. The way that I usually do it is if you start entering a bracket, it'll pop up the plotting interval for X and Y. And I usually use follow the default that's sitting on there, which is give it an X min and X max, and then a Y min and a Y max. Um, so if you wanted to do minus six to six for X and minus six to six for Y, it would look kind of like that. Uh, not kind of like that, it looks like that. That's how you would do that. They don't have to be the same either. Um, so you can put uh, one surface plot on top of another one, even if they have different ranges. Um, they might just show up a little bit funky. So you can see here the uh, plot hasn't updated particularly well. Um, so I'll try clearing all the output and we'll run it again. When you start mixing the axes like that, it usually just kind of picks one and scales the X and Y axis appropriately to that one. <coughs> so I'm gonna fix this other one to be the same range. Excuse me. So we could use this as a way of investigating where we think the root ought to be. Remember, we wanted to solve those two equations so that they're both equal to zero, which means we need to find a place where not just G1 is equal to zero, not just G2 is equal to zero, but they're both equal to zero at the same time. Uh, and that's, uh, the plot that we have here is okay. You can kind of see it, it's probably somewhere over in this region uh, where that seems to happen. But it's kind of difficult to view exactly what's going on there, right? You can try and zoom in a little bit if you want, but they're kind of close together over there. Um, and so there are better ways that we can visualize um, systems of equations, sy systems of two equations at any rate. Uh, and they actually get back to something that we had already done in Excel. So I'm gonna flip over to Excel. I don't think you need to take notes over in Excel because I'm just gonna point out something that we had done previously. Um, when we were uh, first introducing our systems of equations, we had defined everything as these uh, column vectors of variables, right? We bundled them all together and we called them capital Y. And F-solve syntax uses it exactly like that. This was the syntax that we had used for it. When we solved this stuff in um, Excel, we introduced the idea of an objective function or an objective cell where we somehow bundled the results of equation one and two into a single equation. Um, and so the single equation that we had used here was the sum of the squares. Um, and so that was useful because the, Fs, or the, the solver tool inside of Excel needed a syntax that said, I can vary these two over here and the response is just this one over here. And I just keep looking at that single cell. Um, and so this sort of a thing can be useful when you're visualizing stuff because that's all the plot can visualize too, right? When we visualize two separate plots, we're in a system that's kind of stuck like the other one where we've got these two sheets 
and it's kind of hard to visualize what's happening there um, in the sheets. So there are some useful definitions of objective cells, which while not needed in MATLAB, can be pretty helpful for, for visualizing this sort of stuff. Um, and one of them is, of course, this sum of the squares. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit more about the objective cells um, over in MATLAB. But that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out how do I combine the outputs of G1 and G2 uh, into a, a single parameter. So to combine um, G1 and G2 into a function with uh, just one output, that process is to create an objective function. There are some useful properties of objective functions uh, that are, uh, there, there's more than one objective function. They are rather arbitrary, um, but there are a couple of them that behave well. The properties that it needs to have um, is that it's got one input for each variable. In other words, it's not lumped uh, into that capital Y variable like with fsolve. So we're going to keep the variables separate, um, and that's because we're anticipating fsurf is going to use this to plot it as a, a surface, um, and fsurf is expecting a function of two variables. We already said up above what one of the other ones is. The um, output somehow combines the results uh, of both G1 and G2. Whatever this objective function is, um, it should get uh, close to zero in the vicinity of a root. It should also be vectorized. And we'll add one more that we'll come back to um, in a little bit. Uh, it should emphasize uh, values near zero and de-emphasize values far from zero. This one, I, I will note, is um, just for visualization. Visualization. If you're coding up your own solver, you probably wouldn't need to do that. But then again, we don't code our own solvers all that often. So one option that's uh, commonly used is a little bit kind of tricky to write. Um, what it ends up looking like is the maximum of the absolute value of both of those functions. This is commonly uh, implemented in a lot of um, solvers. The reason that it's commonly implemented is because it has a couple of advantages. Well, I mean, really, it's only got one advantage. Uh, it's very fast to execute. So if a computer needs to take the absolute value of something, there's just a single bit that's setting whether or not it's positive or negative. It just sets that bit so that it's positive. So it's not like it has to do any math in order to make something positive. It just changes a single bit and flips its sign if it's necessary. So it's really easy to do something like that for the computer. Um, it's also really easy for a computer to compare two numbers and pick the bigger one. Right? There's no math involved in that. It's just a comparison. Um, and it's, that's very fast. So in that sense, it's a really nice objective function. But on the other hand, it is a little harder to code in vectorized form because it doesn't play quite as nicely uh, with anonymous functions. It is absolutely doable. I mean, it's not like it's hard to uh, come up with a way to make that evaluation. But if you're trying to do it with an, an anonymous function, it's a little bit annoying. Um, it's a fairly convoluted looking statement uh, in order to do something like that, mostly because of the way that MATLAB evaluates the absolute value function and the max function. 
when it receives a vector or a matrix or something like that. Um, it usually goes like row by row. Um, and you have to figure out how do I tell it, just take the absolute value of that individual element in that vector matrix and compare it to the corresponding one in the other matrix. Uh, a little bit annoying. The other option is, of course, the, the one that we've already um, used. And here, the objective function would look like g1 squared plus g2 squared. So it does have a couple of advantages. One, it's easy to write, right? It, it's just the sum of squares of two things. Um, it's easy to interpret in the sense that if I write down that f is the sum of the squares, that's not, you don't have to think very hard looking at an equation like that, what that equation means. Whereas this one, you'd have to look at it a little bit closer to make sure that you understand where the absolute value is being taken and where the max is being taken um, and what the actual comparison is. Part of that gets back to the sum of the squares is vectorized very easily, um, whereas the other one, eh, maybe a little bit less so. This is already vectorized. You don't have to play any games. There's no special inputs or outputs to the functions. Uh, you just square it using the element-wise operator like we already did, and you're all set. The downside is this is computationally slow. because it's got uh, two um, squaring operations, or just two squaring calculations. The addition doesn't cost you very much. It's, it's not, addition is not a slow process, but squaring every element of a large matrix can take a while. And you have to do it twice, right? You have to square both of those um, matrices. On the other hand, you know, when we say it's computationally slow, usually this isn't a problem. Uh, for most applications. The reason being we're not designing a piece of code that has to be like distributed and be able to run as fast as humanly possible because we're not doing any like uh, ultra sophisticated simulations or anything like that. So it's okay if it takes us half a second instead of a quarter of a second, right? It, it didn't really cost us anything. So as a result, we'll use the second one. So if we wanted to code up the second one, we can say f is equal to at x, y. That handles one of the first requirements, right? It says, I'm gonna take two inputs, one of them's x, one of them's y, and I'm gonna expect one output, which is just f. So we can square them and say g1 of x, y, square that and add it to g2 of x, y. So this does not look horribly different from the expression that I wrote up above, um, which again makes it easier to debug, right? When you're going through uh, your code, it, it's, there's not a lot that would go wrong with something like that. It should behave the way that you want. We can surface plot that thing. Uh, we'll do six to six again for both of our axes. And actually, I'm gonna put a figure in front of this so that it doesn't overwrite our previous figure. So it'll make a new one. Uh, and of course, label the axes so that we know what's going on. And Z label, uh, this one is F. So this is our objective function, F. Or actually, let's just put F here. And we'll use that as our title. Objective function. So we plot the objective function and it, it becomes a little bit easier for us to say, where's the minimum? It's not like super easy and we're gonna find a way to make it a, even a little bit easier than it is uh, shown over here. But nevertheless, now we've only got one surface to deal with, right? And remember, because we've squared this and summed this, wherever this value is the smallest, wherever it gets close to zero, that's about where our root ought to be. So I can kind of wiggle this thing around and figure out well, it seems to be kind of over there on the high end of y and like the low end of x. But the problem with this is if you look at the z-axis, it varies over five orders of magnitude. 
an awful lot of that is crap, right? We don't care about if, if a value is 100, that's for us just as bad as a value of 1,000, which is just as bad as 10,000. Um, so it would be nice if we could change this function in some way that it would de-emphasize those really large values and really emphasize the smaller values, right? Really stretch out the smaller values. Because for us, the difference between 0.1 and 0.01 is important, right? That is a lot closer to the solution. But on a scale that goes up to 100, or what is this, 60,000 on the z-axis, 0.1, 0.1, 1, 10, they all look the same, right? They're all basically a flat line, even though to us they are really different. Um, one is much closer than the other. So this last point up here about it should emphasize values near zero and de-emphasize values far from zero. A good way to do this um, is with log base 10. So if you do log base 10 of f, that will do exactly what we're after, which is it'll de-emphasize the large values and emphasize the small values. So down here where I have f, instead of the sum of the squares, I'm just gonna write log 10 of this result. And I'll change my title so that I recall that it's the log base 10 of the objective function. Um, and we'll change our z label so that it says log base 10. Now when you look at the objective function, an awful lot of it is pretty clearly not relevant, right? All of those high values have been squashed. Uh, but there's one point that really stands out, right? It's almost like one of those, if you've ever seen those uh, analogies of uh, space-time as a rubber sheet and there's a black hole sitting on it and it stretches the rubber sheet down. You can see right away where the best solution is uh, because at least on a log scale it is much much less than all of the other ones, right? It's almost a, a needle pointing down um, exactly at where the solution could be. And so this can be really helpful when you're trying to figure out where to make your initial guess. Um, so according to this one, it ought to be x is, you know, maybe somewhere around 5 and y is somewhere around 5 um, because that depression that we have up there is, is pretty close to uh, 5 and 5. Um, if we want to use anonymous functions with f solve, we need a wrapper. So we've got our initial guess. All of that that we just did was to get an initial guess. And that can often be a really challenging part of the simulation or of the, the calculation, which is why we did it here. Um, getting that initial guess uh, is not trivial um, in a lot of cases. But we do need uh, to modify the inputs a little bit if we want to use it with fsolve simply because of the way that fsolve is expecting its inputs. So the wrapper input has to be just plain old y, which we think of as um, being that column vector of x and y. This uh, implies then that x is y of 1 and y is y of 2, which we've seen before, right? We saw that with the, the sandwiching operation that we had previously done the top bun and the bottom bun. It's the same idea, right? We just need a wrapper that implements this. The wrapper also uh, needs to have an output, which I'm gonna call it out. It doesn't have to actually be called out, uh, but it does need to be um, a two by one column vector. And specifically, it needs to be a two by one column vector where the output of G1 is first and the output of G2 is second. Although I guess you could always switch them around. It, it wouldn't really hurt anything if you did G2 and then G1. So we're gonna call our wrapper um, W. The input that we have up there is Y. So it's just plain old Y. And the thing that it needs to output, notice uh, defining an output with an anonymous function is not quite the same as de defining an output with a local function. You don't actually specify that the thing coming out is the variable named out. You just type what the thing is that's gonna come out. 
And so what we're after is something that looks like G1 and G2. That's the style that we're interested in, right? That satisfies um, all of the requirements for the wrapper in the sense that it takes Y as an input and it's still providing us our output and it's G1 on top of G2. What we would like to be able to write is X and Y for both of these. That's what we mean. But an anonymous function doesn't know that X and Y lowercase are related to the capital Y. So we have to explicitly state where in that input Y is X and where in that input Y is Y. And this is where anonymous functions kind of make for an ugly call to F solve. I, I like the local function call to F solve um, because what we have to do now is use indexing in here and say, well, X I know is at the first location in Y. Y is at the second location in Y. And similarly over here, X is the first location and Y is the second index. That to me is harder to read. This line that shows up on my uh, code, I have to do a lot of mental substitution if I want to double check to make sure that that was written correctly. Um, and double checking, of course, that the parentheses are in the right place and the G's are in the right place and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but this is our wrapper function. Once we have it, then we can call F solve the same way we normally would. So we can call it with W um, and we can give it its initial guess, which you know, based on our plot was somewhere over around like five and five. And if we run that, we should get that same answer that we saw before, um, which we did, right? Equation solved. It's, it's up there around three and four. So it does work, right? There's, there's nothing wrong with the way that we've uh, got it written here. And it does lend certain advantages, I think, when it comes time to visualizing things because you've clearly got the two functions written as functions of X and Y up here. So they are kind of easy to uh, debug there. And the calls to F surf are kind of nice because you don't need a lot of input arguments or anything like that. They're nice and clean. Um, the only downside that I have with uh, F surf interacting with F solve is just this wrapper function. The wrapper function tends to look a little bit uglier like that, um, but it's a trade-off, right? I didn't have to write any local functions, um, so I don't have to keep track of code bouncing between the top and the bottom or anything like that. The debugging is, I would say, kind of a wash. It's, it's not exactly easy to debug what might be going wrong inside of an anonymous function, but they should be simple enough that you can catch any typos right away. And originally it was my plan to kind of transition over into ODEs at the end of the day, but then again, introducing ordinary differential equations in 10 minutes on a Friday afternoon in week nine is probably not the best way for you to actually remember any of that stuff. So I think we're probably better off just wrapping it up maybe 10 minutes early. Um, and then we can fresh, start fresh with ODEs uh, on Monday rather than try to cram in some uh, terminology that we'll just have to repeat anyway on Monday. Uh, yeah, I think we'll wrap it up there. So f plot and f0 go together well for functions of one variable, and f surf and f solve tend to go together fairly well for functions of two variables. If you get up to three or more, if it's just three, try as hard as you can to get it down to two, because then you can use these tools all over again. Um, but if you do three or more and you can't get them down to two, about all you can do, use is F solve. There's not really a great way to visualize anything like that um, because it requires another dimension that we don't have access to. Um, so you're kind of SOL if you get up to that many. Hopefully something about the problem has been enough uh, that you have an idea of where that guess needs to come from because um, these tools won't work. On the other hand, there's not a lot of problems where you have more than two variables, at least not that come up every, very often. So we'll wrap it up there. Um, if you're watching on Twitch, I'm still over in Canvas chat if you've got any questions for after the lecture is over. Um, but otherwise, we'll leave it at that. I'll get these things posted. Um, and we'll see you back here on Monday. Have a very nice weekend, everybody.